In this final section, we're going to change gears and talk about some of the practices that can offer solutions to the problem that are posed by conventional agriculture. The collection of more traditional agricultural practices that came out of the Green Revolution, monoculture, pesticide use, synthesizer fertilizer, synthetic fertilizers, all of these things have provided benefits, but also created problems. So what are some answers to those problems? That's what this section is dedicated to discussing. Alternative agriculture describes agricultural practices that deviate from the conventional methods that were developed during the Green Revolution. There are two main schools of alternative agriculture. Those are organic agriculture and conservation agriculture. The priority of organic agriculture uh, is uh, to avoid the application of synthetic chemicals to crops. So synthetic pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and other chemicals are prohibited from something to be considered organically grown. Organic agriculture also prohibits the cultivation of GMO crops. In conservation agriculture, the priority is soil health. There are three tenets that support this priority. First, achieve minimal surface, minimal disturbance to the soil by reducing the amount of tilling or by not tilling the soil at all. Because tilling disturbs the soil ecosystem and diminishes its ability to retain the nutrients and beneficial organisms that contribute to plant health, and it also exacerbates soil erosion. Secondly, maintaining permanent soil cover by allowing the cropland to always remain covered by crop residues, meaning leftover plant debris, or by planting cr cover crops between growing seasons. By preventing the soil from be becoming barren and exposed, the water retention of the soil is improved. The texture and compaction is also improved, and you also get more organic matter, which can decay and serve as a natural source of fertilizer. And finally, crop rotation is encouraged um, as a practice in conservation agriculture, meaning not growing the same crop on the same plot of land season after season, but rather rotating through a variety of different crops. So as you can see, two distinct approaches, both with their own priorities and their own merits. And each permits things that the other does not. For example, in organic agriculture, tilling is fine and monocropping rather than crop rotation is also fine. Whereas those things are not part of the practice of conservation agriculture. Conversely, in conservation agriculture, you can use pesticides and fertilizers and GMOs, all of which are prohibited in organic agriculture. However, one thing that these approaches share in common is that they both lead to improved biodiversity and have a lower em environmental impact compared to conventional agricultural methods. Next, we're going to take a look at some of the specific practices that might be a part of one or the other of these alternative agriculture approaches. One of these alternative agriculture practices is called integrated pest management. The goal of integrated pest management is to reduce the use of chemical pesticides by, first of all, relying as much as possible on non-chemical pest control measures. Keeping pest organisms at low levels that don't cause too much damage, rather than aiming to totally eradicate them. And finally, using pesticides judiciously, when necessary, as a last result, in a way that avoids harm, harming beneficial insects, humans, and the environment. Really, integrated pest management means using all tools available to you in your arsenal to prevent the need for chemical pesticides. Some of which might be forms of genetic control, like selecting varieties of crops um, that have some level of natural pest resistance. It could also include behavioral control, uh, using things like pheromone traps that attract the pests using artificial insect pheromones. Biological control would include ensuring that you have a healthy soil and cropland ecosystem full of beneficial organisms that can serve as predators to pests. And then if you really don't do need to use chemical control, chemical pesticides, treat them as a last resort and be very careful about which pesticides you choose to use and how you apply them in order to do it in a way that minimizes ecological and health consequences. Let's take a moment and talk a little bit more about one of these things, biological control, and how it works. 
Biological control methods utilize one species to reduce the populations of a different species. It basically takes advantage of natural predator-prey relationships so that organisms, mostly insects, that prey on other insects or weeds can do the pest control work for you. This is a growing area of pest control with many instances where it is already being used successfully, such as using ladybugs to reduce aphid populations. As ladybugs are a natural predator of aphids, if you're ever in the garden section of a hardware store or nursery in the springtime, you will see live ladybugs for sale. That's what their purpose is, to release in your garden and kill aphids. Other use cases, including parasitic wasps being released to reduce moth populations, using Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt bacteria, to reduce mosquito and moth larvae, use of leaf beetles to go after a weed called purple loosestrife, and others as well. The goal in all of these cases is not to eradicate the, but the best, but to knock down their population to levels that they uh, don't have an economically significant impact on the harvest. Another alternative agriculture approach that can improve pest control as well as other factors is intercropping, also known as polyculture. Intercropping is the practice of growing two or more crops in close proximity to each other for all or part of their life cycle. It's an alternative to monoculture that improves the biodiversity of the local ecosystem, improves soil health, and makes pest management easier because when you only grow one thing in an enormous plot, you've created a seamless smorgasbord for pests that like to eat that plant. So pest outbreaks can be reduced by better controlled uh, by or better controlled with polyculture. It's also possible to choose to intercrop plants that have very specific symbiotic benefits toward one another. When this occurs on a farm level, it's called intercropping, but when it occurs on a garden level, it's called companion planting. And if you are a gardener, the old Farmer's Almanac website has a great companion planting chart that you can look up with a list of symbiotic plant pairs and an explanation of the benefits of planting them together. Here's a snippet of that chart. One example is that tomato and basil can be planted together because basil has a deterrent effect against certain pests, including the hornworm, which is a predator of tomatoes. Another approach to facilitating improved biodiversity and avoiding the pitfalls of monoculture is crop rotation. This is where, rather than grow multiple different plants at the same time alongside each other, multiple different plants are grown in sequence in the same field. Crop rotation has several benefits. It improves soil nutrient levels uh, because not every plant has the same exact same nutritional requirements. If you only grow one plant and that plant is a heavy, a very heavy nitrogen user, then the soil becomes depleted of nitrogen more easily. Whereas if you grow several different plants with different nutritional profiles, then you don't run as great of a risk of depleting the soil. Crop rotation also interrupts pest life cycles. If you monocrop tomatoes, for example, every year the tomato hornworm larvae will hatch and feed on your tomatoes. But if they hatch one year and you're growing corn instead, their source of nutrition is missing and their life cycle is interrupted. This means the same way for this works the same way for plant diseases as well. Crop rotation can also allow farmers to diversify what they are growing and thereby reduce their economic risk. If you're only growing corn and it's a bad year for corn, then you're all in on a bad thing. Whereas if you grow a variety of crops and one has a bad year, then your downside risk is smaller. The last alternative, uh, AG practice, we'll talk about is reduced tillage. Uh, tilling is the practice of plowing and breaking up the topsoil to prepare it for cultivation. It's common in conventional agriculture because the use of heavy machinery on the land causes soil to become compacted. And compaction in, is this, for the soil is a bad thing because it reduces the ability of plant roots to penetrate the soil and grow properly. 
It makes the soil inhospitable for beneficial organisms like earthworms, for example, and impedes water infiltration into the soil and promotes erosion, which can lead to nutrient issues. In alternative agriculture, tillage can either be used to in what is called minimal tillage or completely eliminated in what's called no tillage. These methods aren't aren't appropriate for all soil types, but when done appropriately, they can lead to improved soil health and greater productivity. Much of what we just described as being alternative agricultural practices also supports the goals of a related concept, which is sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture was defined in the 1990 Farm Bill as, quote, an integrated system of plant and animal production practices having site-specific application that will, over the long term, satisfy human food and fiber needs, enhance environmental quality, and the natural resource base upon which the agricultural economy depends, make the most efficient use of non-renewable renewable resources and on-farm resources, and integrate, where appropriate, natural, biological cycles, and controls. Sustain the eco economic viability of farm operations. Enhance the quality of life for farmers and society as a whole. If you remember back in chapter one, where we talked about the three pillars of sustainability being environment, economy, and society, you can see all three of those pillars built into the goals that Congress has laid out for making our agricultural system sustainable. We certainly have not met those goals, but on many of these points, conditions have improved as alternative agricultural practices have become more widely adopted. There are still challenges and barriers faced in developing a sustainable agricultural system. Most of this is because alternative agricultural practices tend to be more, more costly to carry out and can be associated with lower yield. Organic sources of fertilizer, such as manure and worm castings, are more expensive than synthetic fertilizers, and also integrated pest management approaches are more complex and expensive than synthetics. The higher costs associated with alternative agriculture um, can then translate to a higher cost of products at the grocery store, which limits the market for those products to people who can afford them. Alternative agriculture, uh, agricultural practices also tend to generate lower yield. Non-GMO variety crop varieties generally have lower yields than GMO varieties, and for this reason and others, organically raised crops have been found to have an average of 19% lower yield compared to conventional agriculture. The no-tillage method, uh, which is part of conservation agriculture, has also been found to produce about a 5% lower yield on average compared to conventional agriculture. Nonetheless, alternative and sustainable agriculture are both still on the rise in spite of these challenges, which is a positive thing for both human health and environmental health.